Amen. So you're there in Isaiah chapter 64, and we just have a few more chapters uh, left in the book of Isaiah. Um, this one's not super long, but uh, definitely some interesting stuff in here. And the first thing that we see here is talking about God's anger, really, and Him coming in, in the presence of the Lord and what that entails. Notice what it says in verse 1 here. It says, Oh, that thou wouldest rend the heavens, that thou wouldest come down, that the mountains might flow down at thy presence. As when the, the melting fire burneth, the fire causeth the waters to boil, to make thy name known to thine adversaries, that the nations may tremble at thy presence. When thou didst terrible things, which we looked not for, thou camest down, the mountains flowed down at thy presence. So what is this? This is like dealing with a volcano. I mean, if you think about, think about the wording here. It says that the mountains, in verse 1, might flow down at thy presence. Now, when you look at that, you may say, well, what does that mean, flowing down? But verse 2, it says, as when the melting fire burneth. This is talking about lava. Okay, so you're talking about basically this eruption of fire and brimstone. And, and notice what it says, the fire causes the waters to boil. So you've probably all seen this where you've seen like volcanoes being poured out into the ocean. It literally causes the ocean to boil, right, or the seas or the waters to boil. Um, and it says at the at ver, end of verse 3 there, it says that mountains flow down at thy presence. And the thing that you keep seeing here is that at thy presence, in thy presence, at thy presence. And so at the presence of the Lord, there's fire. Okay? And particularly, we're talking about fire that's coming up out of mountains and flowing down the mountains and going into the ocean or going into the waters, if you will, to cause them to boil. And go to Nahum 1. Nahum 1. It's a great passage, first of all, but it deals with the presence of the Lord. That's what it says in Nahum 1 and verse 2. Nahum 1 and verse 2. God is jealous, and the Lord revenges. The Lord revenges and is furious. The Lord will take vengeance on his adversaries, and it reserveth wrath for his enemies. Sound familiar? Because in verse 2 of Isaiah 64, it, it talks about the fact that he's going to make thy name known to thine adversaries. So he's talking about destroying his enemies. And notice in verse 3 of Nahum 1, it says, The Lord is slow to anger and great in power, and will not at all acquit the wicked. The Lord hath his way in the whirlwind and in the storm, and the clouds are the dust of his feet. He rebuketh the sea and maketh it dry, and drieth up all the rivers. Bashan languisheth, and Carmel, and the flower of Lebanon languisheth. So it's talking about like the power of the Lord that he's in the whirlwind. And what is a whirlwind? Well, a tornado is a whirlwind. Also, a hurricane is a whirlwind. So there's different types of whirlwinds that you can think about. But I'll say this, when you think about natural disasters dealing with wind, what are the two things you think about? You think about tornadoes and you think about like a hurricane or a typhoon, depending on which part of the, if you're in, coming from the, the Pacific or you're in the Atlantic, right? Um, but the thing, the thing is you're dealing with God drying up the sea, he's in the whirlwind. Verse five, the mountains quake at him, and the hills melt. And the earth is burned at his presence, yea, the world and all that dwell therein. Who can stand before his indignation, and who can abide in the fierceness of his anger? His fury is poured out like fire. Now, you think about that now. What is he talking about, being poured out like fire? Usually when you think of fire, you don't think of it being poured out. But when you think about the fact that the hills are melting, and the fact that he's causing the, the mountains to flow down, and that the fire, the melting fire is burning, then you're dealing with lava. You're dealing with, you know, and it'd be technical magma coming up out of the earth, and then it's lava when it's outside, you know, anyway. But that being said is that you're dealing with the fire that's in the earth, right? The earth is just, inside the earth is just a big ball of fire. It's a big ball of melting fire, and Keep reading there. In verse 7, it says, The Lord is good, a stronghold in the day of trouble, and he knoweth them that trust in him. But with an overrunning flood, he will make an utter end of the place thereof, and darkness shall pursue his enemies. What do ye imagine against the Lord? He will make an utter end. Affliction shall not rise up the second time. And I, and I love this passage because it's talking about God's anger, his jealousy, and how he's going to destroy mightily. And he's basically saying, I will make an utter end, meaning that it, it's not going to rise up a second time. Girls, be quiet. 
Now, go to Deuteronomy 32, because when I think about volcanoes, I think about hell, to be honest with you. Um, now, obviously, hell, you know, where, where the souls of men are at, you know, all the dead, where they're at, that's a spiritual realm, okay? And so, when you're talking about, like, the center of the earth being a big ball of fire, I mean, that's a physical thing that's going on, okay, outside of the spiritual realm. But, obviously, hell is also fire as well. And, but right now, those that are in hell, you know, the rich man that lift up his eyes in hell, He's not physically, bodily there in hell. Now, the lake of fire will be a bodily, spiritual, you know, hell, if you will, because that's where you have the resurrection of the unjust. And so, but look at Deuteronomy 32 and verse 21. And I want you to go to the mother baby room now. And Deuteronomy 32 and verse 21, it says, They have moved me to jealousy with that which is not God. They have provoked me to anger with their vanities, and I will move them to jealousy with those which are not a people. I will provoke them to anger with a foolish nation, for a fire is kindled in mine anger, and shall burn unto the lowest hell, and shall consume the earth with her increase, and set on fire the foundations of the mountains. So see the correlation of hell, where hell's at, first of all, but also the fact that, hey, there's just fire underneath the mountains, and at God's presence... We see the fact that the, the fire that's within the earth is coming out and, you know, basically melting down the mountains or flowing down the mountains and going into the, into the waters and boiling the waters. It's so hot. And, you know, no marvel because the Bible says in Deuteronomy 4, 24, it says, For the Lord thy God is a consuming fire, even a jealous God. Now, it's, it's interesting to me when people think that hell is separation from God's presence <laughs> because... Do you see that? Do you see where, where it's talking about God's presence not being there? Because actually, you know what it is? It's from the presence of the Lord because our Lord is a consuming fire. Did you know that hell is, is fueled by his presence? That's why it's just, it's, un, it's unbelievable when, when, uh, when people, now, a lot of people believe that ignorantly, right? They're just like, well, he's separated, you know, we're separated from our God, from our sins, and they kind of take that too far. You know, and then say, well, hell is separation because of the sins, right? But then you've got to negate all these verses where it's talking about at his presence, that he's setting on fire the foundations of the mountains with his anger, okay? That's what's kindling hell, is his anger and his presence that's there. So that being said is that, you know, we see at the very beginning here that, uh, you know, the Lord, he's a consuming fire. God is a consuming fire. He's a jealous God. And at his presence and at his, you know, coming, you're going to have fire and brimstone, which, you know, makes sense because when Jesus comes in the clouds, the first thing that's going to happen, he's going to rain fire down on the earth. And then you have all these trumpets and there's actually, uh, you know, the first woe, the fifth trumpet is, is the, the bottomless pit being opened up and smoke ascending out and locusts from hell coming out and, and basically tormenting men. So, you know, there's definitely going to be punishments that are dealing with fire and brimstone. Now go to Isaiah 64 and verse 4. Now here's a verse that's actually mentioned in the New Testament. And the New Testament expounds on this verse. So in Isaiah 64, we kind of just see it and we, we know it because we know that the New Testament talks about it. Um, but notice what it says in verse 4. So Isaiah 64 and verse 4, it says, For since the beginning of the world, men have not heard, nor perceive by the ear, neither hath the eye seen, O God, beside thee, what he hath prepared for him that waiteth for him. Now go to 1 Corinthians chapter 2, 1 Corinthians chapter 2, because it's going to bring this up. Now what's interesting is that it says waiteth for him. Now in the New Testament, it's going to say them that love him. But it's interesting because we're talking about God and his presence, you know, that he's going to come. And it's basically saying, the chapter starts off with Isaiah saying, Oh, that thou wouldest rend the heavens, right? And you can kind of think about when Jesus comes, what's, what's one of the big things that's going to happen? The heavens are going to depart as a scroll. And you can kind of think about his coming and how dramatic that's going, going to be and all that. And then you can think about the fact that, talking about what he has prepared for them that waited for him. And there, there's, there's a lot in the Bible about waiting for him, waiting for his appearing, loving his appearing. And 
you know, these things may not be completely synonymous, like waiting and, lo and loving, but at the same time, you know, if you love him, you'll wait for him, right? And, you know, waiting for him is just th the idea that the Bible gets across here is that there's a, there's a huge blessing for those that watch and wait and are waiting for his coming and that love his appearing and that are, you know, diligently uh, actually yearning for it, okay? But in 1 Corinthians chapter 2 and verse 6, we're going to see a little more information as far as what that verse in Isaiah 64, 4 is talking about. In verse 6 here, so 1 Corinthians 2 and verse 6, it says, Howbeit we speak wisdom among them that are perfect, yet not the wisdom of this world, nor of the princes of this world that come to naught. Now to give some context here, he just got done saying that when I first came unto you, I, I, you know, I sought to know, not know anything but Christ Jesus and him crucified, meaning that when you go to unsaved people, the, first, the only thing that you really are caring to tell them about is the, the death, burial, and resurrection. You're talking about the gospel. You're not going to get into some deep doctrines with somebody if they're not saved. But then he goes on to say, well, how be it we speak wisdom unto them that are perfect, meaning that you know, when you're thinking about when you come to the house of God, that's not a time just to hear the gospel over and over again. It's a time to hear the wisdom and the deep things of God, you know, deep doctrine. Now, I'm not saying that the gospel can't be brought up and you can't be preaching hard about, like, keeping the gospel crystal clear. Obviously, that's true. But when we're, talking, when we're in the house of God, we're, talking, we're dealing with people that are uh, of just men made perfect. You know, the, the idea of, uh, you know, saved people that we're talking to here. But in verse 7 there, it says, But we speak the wisdom of God in a mystery, even the hidden wisdom which God ordained from before the world unto our glory. Now, notice that... It says that we speak wisdom of God in a mystery, even the wi hidden wisdom which God ordained before the world unto our glory. So what did it say? The very first part of Isaiah 64, 4, it says, For since the beginning of the world men have not heard. But now there's, there's a difference here. And I'm going to show you that there's a difference. When you're in the New Testament, there is a difference. And you want to see, you say, man, I wish I was back in the Old Testament when I could, I could see the parting of the Red Sea or I could see this or that. No, you should be blessed and honored that we're in the New Testament because there is, there's, uh, I'm going to show you right here that the blessing of being in the New Testament and having the Holy Ghost indwelling us. In verse uh, 8 there, it says, Which none of the princes of this world knew. For had they known it, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. Notice in verse 9, But as it is written, I hath not seen, nor ear heard, neither have entered into the heart of man the things which God hath prepared for them that love him. Now, notice that the first portion of Isaiah 64, 4 isn't mentioned, right? It was mentioned actually before that. It kind of started off talking about this, and then it says, as it is written. So it's basically like talking about the fact that, hey, there's this mystery and the wisdom of God that, you know, that, we are, that was ordained before the, before the world unto our glory, meaning that there's this wisdom that we're going to know that was from the foundation of the world that they, didn't, they weren't grasping. A lot of these things. The New Testament is more revealed, my friends. Those in the Old Testament knew salvation. They knew the gospel, but I don't believe they knew, uh, you know, the Word of God like we know the Word of God. Because there is a difference in the way, the way that God obviously, uh, you know, teaches us the Word in, in the New Testament. Um, notice, keep reading there. It says in verse 10, But God hath revealed them unto us by his Spirit. So notice that it's saying, I have not seen nor ear heard, neither have entered into the heart of man the things which God hath prepared for them that love him, but God hath revealed them unto us by his Spirit. Do you see a contrast there? It's not saying that we don't know now. It's saying from the beginning of the world they didn't know. And, but now there's a difference. But it says, But God hath revealed them unto us by his Spirit, for the Spirit searcheth all things, yea, the deep things of God. We're talking about that hidden wisdom, that, that mystery, right? The mystery, and you think about the mystery of God, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory, right? The, the, the Bible talks about, uh, and it even talks about the mystery of the gospel, and the idea that, obviously, they believed the gospel. They believed that God was going to pay for their sins, and that there's going to be this sacrifice for their sins. But, it was kind of like looking through a glass darkly as far as what, how that was going to be accomplished. Okay? They knew there was a Christ. They knew that there was going to be a Redeemer, but they didn't understand exactly 
how that was going to be accomplished. They knew it was going to be accomplished. They believed in it. Abraham believed God and was imputed unto him for righteousness, and he believed that he was going to give him eternal life. But, you know, there's a lot of things that they, they weren't, like, putting on. They didn't have all... I guess they, you could think about the puzzle pieces were there, but trying to put it all together and see it. Whereas in the New Testament, we have the Holy Ghost, and the Holy Ghost searcheth all things, yea, the deep things of God, and reveals them unto us. And then it says, for verse 11, it says, because some, some people will say, well, you know, uh, yeah, the Holy Ghost speaks to me. It's like, no, the Holy Ghost will not speak of himself, meaning that he's not going to speak anything that, that Jesus didn't already speak. So, Notice what it says here in verse 11. It says, For what man, uh, for what man knoweth the things of man, save the spirit of, of man which is in him? Even so, the things of God knoweth no man but the spirit of God. Now we have received, not the spirit of the world, but the spirit which is of God, that we might know the things that are freely given to us of God, which things also we speak, not in words which man's wisdom teacheth, but which the Holy Ghost teacheth, comparing spiritual things with spiritual we're comparing spiritual things with spiritual. We're rightly dividing the word of truth. And the workman that, uh, you know, study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. We're, spir we're comparing spiritual things with spiritual, scripture with scripture, the word of God with the word of God. But the anointing which you have received of him abideth in you, and you need not that any man teach you. But as the same anointing teacheth you of all things, and is truth, and is no lie, and even as it hath taught you, you shall abide in him. And the idea there is that we have an unction from the Holy One, and ye know all things. And it's interesting because in Isaiah, it's basically stating, yeah, for since the beginning of the world, men have not heard and they, they you know, or perceived the things that God has prepared for them that wait for him. And in the New Testament, it's saying, but now we have the Spirit of God. Do you see the difference? And there's a, a huge blessing and you think about going through the book of Isaiah. Imagine going through the book of Isaiah without the New Testament. Think about that for a second. Just the New Testament. Now, obviously, we have the Holy Ghost inside of us, too. We have that anointing. We have that unction. Which, they would have the Spirit of God come upon them. And I'm not saying, like, God wouldn't show them truths and everything. But the Bible says, God, who at sundry times and diverse manners spake unto the fathers, or spake, unto the pro spake, spake by the pro I'm going to mess that up completely. God, who at sundry times and diverse manners, spake in time past unto the fathers by the prophets, hath in these last days spoken unto us by his Son. Meaning that, obviously, when Jesus, you think about the New Testament, and when Jesus was on the scene, that is way more revealed in just, you know, ex explaining exactly what's going on. I mean, think about the Beatitudes, you know, the, the Sermon on the Mount. He's saying, you have heard this, but I say unto you this. He's just, he just clarifying, shining a light on it, and giving you the details of the matter. And just really honing in, like, you've heard this, this is in the law, but hey, let me show you some more about that. And Jesus is constantly doing that. Now, so that's something to think about, you know, with this verse here, is the fact that in the Old Testament, you know what, they're kind of thinking, well, yeah, from the beginning of the world, we, we, we don't know. We, don't, we, we can't comprehend that. Now, obviously, even today, with the Holy Ghost, you know, the Bible talks about the fact that we still look through a glass darkly. You know, and it's not until we see him face to face and see him for as he is that we're really going to fully comprehend everything. But we know a lot more, you know, as far as like the, seeing all the pictures being revealed. And you, you think about the fact that we don't have like God showing all these signs and wonders down here. But we don't need that. Actually, we have something better. Better than signs and wonders is the Word of God. Better than signs and wonders is having the Holy Ghost living inside of you and teaching you all things. I'll take that any day over signs and wonders because we walk not by sight. We walk by faith and not by sight. So uh, go to Isaiah chapter 64 and verse 5. Isaiah 64 and verse 5. <clears throat> I'm just going to say this. This verse right here is one of the hardest verses I've ever seen in the Bible to try to figure out grammatically. Okay? I'm not saying it's the hardest, but it's one of the hardest I've ever looked at and tried to figure out. 
not that there is anything about this verse that you're just like, oh man, that seems like it's contradictory or, you know, like a problem passage or anything like that. It's just, all right, I'm going to read it. And if you're, if you come up to me later and be like, listen, that's easy. What were you thinking? Um, then more power to you. <laughs> okay. But when, uh, verse five here, it says, thou meetest him that rejoiceth and worketh righteousness. Those that remember thee in thy ways, behold, thou art wroth. For we have sinned. In those is continuance, and we shall be saved. So, you know, maybe some of you are like, I can, I know exactly what that means. Right off the cuff, I know what that means. But I, I, I don't know how long I looked at this verse and tried to, and I'm trying to construct it and everything else. But, okay, I'm going to give you what I believe or the, the grammar. Because you have like a, a, a colon. I'll just tell you, when you look at this, right, it looks like thou meetest him that rejoiceth and worketh righteousness. Those that remember thee in thy ways is like one sentence, right? That's kind of like one thought that's being made. Does that make sense? Thou meetest, meaning like you kind of meet, you know, kind of have a boat or meet up with and kind of, you kind of think about walking with kind of thing. Those that rejoice and work righteousness and remember him in his ways. So that makes, makes a lot of sense. And I do believe that's what it means. But what I'm saying is that, but then there's a colon that says, behold, thou art wroth. And then there's a semicolon. So usually when you think of a semicolon, you think of like, okay, that could be its own sentence, right? Wherever the semicolon is, that could be its own sentence. And you can put a period right there. And then it goes, for we have sinned, in those is continuance, and we shall be saved. So here's where it, I'm just like, what is this talking about? In those is continuance. Who's the those that it's talking about, right? Now, I'll say this. I'm going to tell you what I believe this is talking about. But you go to any other version, they mess this thing up completely. Actually, look at any other version, and they'll actually put a question mark at the end of the sentence. You know where it says, and we shall be saved? They put a question mark. Where this is a statement saying, and we shall be saved, okay? So they put a question mark, shall we be saved? The New King James says something, and, and how shall we be saved? So it's not a question, it, well, it basically says something to the effect of it's a statement, but it's kind of a, a statement in which it's, it's not uh, saying we will be saved. It's basically saying, you know, it's, it, like it's, it's going to be hard to be saved. That's the complete opposite of what it's saying. It's saying, we shall be saved. So, the King James is right. I'm going to say that, first of all. But you say, well, what is this talking about? Well, grammar. And here's the thing, though. This is where it gets tricky because you're dealing with, okay, let's look at the pronouns. Thou meetest him that rejoices and worketh righteousness, those that remember thee in thy ways. Okay? So I believe that's all talking about the same thing. He's kind of talking about him, but then it uses those as if, like him is dealing with multiple people. Him is kind of just a generic, like, you know, the guy that goes to the store, right? But you're kind of generically saying, like, anybody that goes to the store. Um, but then it says, Behold, thou art wroth, for we have sinned, in those is continuance, and we shall be saved. So if you follow the pronouns of those, I believe in those is continuance is referring back to those that remember thee in thy ways. Okay? And the we have sinned and we shall be saved are both together because the we obviously is the same pronoun. Does that, that make sense? You say, well, what is this talking about? Well, go, and let's keep reading there in verse uh, six there, first of all. It says, but we are all as an unclean thing. So when it says we have sinned and we shall be saved, the we goes into verse 6, but we are all as an unclean thing, and all our righteousnesses are as filthy rags. And we all do fade as a leaf, and our iniquities, like the wind, have taken us away. And there is none that calleth upon thy name, that stirreth up himself to take hold of thee. For thou hast hid thy face from us, and hast consumed us because of our iniquities. So you, do you see how it's very consistent with the us, our, we, after that, talking about our sins, okay? So he's basically stating in verse 5, like, those that do this, and the guy that does this, God's going to meet with him, right? But you're wroth with us because we've sinned, but then it says, and we shall be saved. And 
go to Romans chapter 2. Romans chapter 2, because the first thing that I think about when I think about this is, first of all, I look at the pronouns, and the those is used earlier in the, in the verse. And it says, and those is continuance. It, 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 it makes me think of Romans chapter 2 here. Romans chapter 2, because we're talking about being saved or being destroyed. Right? We're talking about God's wrath compared to God's you know, like salvation, if you will. But notice in verse 5 here, it says, But after thy hardness and impenitent heart treasures up unto thyself wrath against the day of wrath and revelation of the righteous judgment of God, who will render to every man according to his deeds, to them who by patient continuance in well-doing seek for glory and honor and immortality eternal life. But unto them that are contentious and do not obey the truth, but obey unrighteousness, indignation and wrath, tribulation and anguish upon every soul of man that doeth evil of the Jew first and also to the Gentile. But glory, honor, and peace to every man that worketh good to the Jew first and also to the Gentile. For there is no respect of persons with God. Now, what people usually do with Romans 2 is they just rip it out of context. Okay? And they just say, well, see, if you want eternal life, then you need to be patient continuance in well-doing. But the problem with that is that no one can do that. Go to Romans chapter 3, because the Bible says that we have concluded all under sin. So the key here is that it's showing you a dichotomy that, hey, we've sinned, but we shall be saved. Right? If you don't sin, you don't need saved. Does that make sense? Like, so that's why it says we, we have sinned, you're wroth, we have sinned, and we shall be saved. And the thing is, if you think of Romans 2, Romans 2 is basically painting you this picture that you're inexcusable those that ju- if you judge someone else about being a sinner because you're a sinner too. That's the whole point of the chapter is the fact that you're a Jew and uh, you call yourself a Jew and you rest in the law, but you know you preach that thou shalt not commit adultery. Thou shalt commit adultery. That you preach thou shalt not kill. That thou kill. You know, and it goes down through this line of like you pre- you say not to do this, but you do it too. Because Romans 2 is stating that if you, if someone, by patient continuance in well-doing, and the key there is continuance, okay? Because if you keep the whole law and yet offend in one point, you're guilty of all. That means that in those is continuance, okay? Meaning that the only way to go to heaven is to be perfect, and sinless and to be in a continuous state of righteousness in the way of righteousness like working righteousness rejoicing and remembering the ways of the lord in those is continuance but we have sinned but we shall be saved why because romans 3 answers that question right so romans 2 is basically setting you up to say hey you're inexcusable because you're saying i don't sin (laughs) okay like the jew is resting in the law but he's a transgressor. But Romans 2 is stating, yeah, if you were continuous and well-doing and you just and you didn't do any wrong, then there won't be any wrath against you. You'll have immortality. You'll have eternal life. And that's why when the rich young ruler came up to Jesus, he said, you know, what, must, what good thing shall I do to have eternal life? He says, keep the commandments. Keep, keep the commandments and thou shalt live. That's what Romans 2 is saying. But here's the problem. No one can do that. And this verse, though it's very kind of complicated in its, in its grammar, is, is actually like Romans 2 and 3 combined. Okay? Because it's basically stating that he's going to meet with those that rejoice and work with righteousness, but in those is continuous, meaning that you have to have continuance in that for him to be meeting with you and to have you know, glory and honor and immortality and eternal life, that has to be a continual thing that you never mess up on. But it's saying, Thou art wroth, for we have sinned, and we shall be saved, though. Why? Because notice what it says in Romans 3 and verse 23. For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Very clear, right? All have sinned. We have concluded all under sin, whether Jew or Gentile. All have sinned. Verse 24. Being justified freely by His grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God has set forth to be a propitiation through faith in his blood, to declare his righteousness for the remission of sins that are passed through the forbearance of God. 
So when it, that verse in verse five, it's, it's kind of very, it's really complicated. Okay, it's really complicated in how it's grammatically put together, but it's basically stating that the Lord will meet with those that are righteous. But that in that is continuance. But we've sinned, and we shall be saved. And it's and, and then he reiterates the sins, right? He basically says our righteousnesses are as filthy rags. So he's kind of hitting on the fact that we're not continuous in being righteous because our righteousnesses are as filthy rags to the Lord. We're all an unclean thing. But we shall be saved. Do you see how all these versions just mess that up? Because they're like, how shall we be saved? They'd be kind of like saying, for all of sin to come glory, short of the glory of God. Well, how, who can be saved then? Well, the Bible says we're justified freely by His grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. That's how we're saved. That's the redemption. And so it, it's, a, it's a pretty complicated verse. Okay? And like I said, if you don't think that's complicated, then I'm going to be calling you next time when I, have, when I have issues with my grammar, okay? Because to me, that is a very complicated verse. Now, um, I think that there's ways to look at it, but even knowing what I just showed you there, it's still kind of like when you read that, just like you would think, you know, it would be in a different order on how you'd say it. But I think basically what it's stating is that he's meeting those that are righteous, but he's angry with us. He's meeting those that are righteous, right? It's kind of like those. Now we know those people don't exist, right? Does that make sense? It's like, it's like Romans 2. It's talking about this group of people, but we know they don't exist. And he, then he states that they don't exist, right? It's kind of like this hypothetical of like, yeah, if you continue in it, like when he tells the rich man, yeah, yeah do the commandments and live. No one can do it, but you know, hypothetically, yes. Romans 2, if you do this, you'll have immortality, you have eternal life, because everyone that doeth good, whether Jew or Gentile, is going to be blessed of God. But the problem is, is there's continuance. And in Romans 2, it says that there has to be a patient continuance in well-doing. You have to be perfect at it, and don't mess up. And in, in Isaiah 64, I believe that's what it's saying. It says, in those is continuance. If you're going to try to go by being righteous, in that is continuance. And, but, the bio, but what he's saying is, but we've sinned. All our righteousnesses are our filthy rags. So I hope that makes sense. I hope I unpack that for you a little bit. I'm just going to be honest with you. That's one of the hardest verses. You know, and I'm doing all these contradictions of the Bible. Those are all easy <laughs> compared to like the grammar. And again, when you read this, it's not like you're like, man, there's something wrong with the, there's a contradiction here or something. It's not like you're looking at like there's a contradiction. It's just the fact that you're just like, what is that saying? Like, you know. So, uh, hopefully that makes sense. Like I said, one of the harder verses that I've ever seen to try to uh, interpret. But going on, Isaiah 64 and verse 8. Isaiah 64 and verse 8. Isaiah 64 and verse 8, it says, But now, O Lord, thou art our father, we are the clay, and thou art potter, and we all are the work of thy hand. So this is a common uh, correlation that the Bible gives as far as God being the potter and us being the clay. He's our maker, we're the creation. Right? It makes sense, but he gives this correlation of basically he can mold us how he wants. You know, he's the potter, he's the one that is determining how you get molded, okay? And uh, Isaiah, go to Isaiah chapter uh, 29 and just show you some other places where it says this. Isaiah 29, Isaiah 29 verse 15, it says, Woe unto them that seek deep to hide their counsel from the Lord, and their works are in the dark, and they say, Who seeth us, and who knoweth us? Surely your turning of things upside down shall be esteemed as the potter's clay. For shall the work say unto him that made it, he made me not? Or shall the thing framed say of him that framed it, he had no understanding? Now, when you think about this, I believe this as a holistic, um, God's the potter, we're the clay. Meaning this, is that isn't God the creator of everybody, whether they're saved or lost? I don't care who it is, he made them all. He made everybody. He made everything. So, 
holistically, when you think about the fact that he's the potter and every person is his clay, basically it's like the clay, and here it's saying the clay is saying to the potter, you know, you didn't make me. You think of the atheist, right? You didn't make me. It's the clay talking to the potter like, you didn't form me, you didn't make me, you didn't create me. You know how foolish that is? That's how foolish that statement is when, when you have someone that's an atheist that says that God didn't make him. Now, it also says he had, he had no understanding. Like, talking about the person that framed him, you, don't, you didn't have any understanding. And that's what evolution teaches. That's what these atheists think, is that basically in the beginning there was no intelligence, right? There's no intelligent design. It, was just, it just popped into existence like a magic wand, you know, there was no one behind it, okay? Now, go to Jeremiah chapter 18. Jeremiah chapter 18. Jeremiah chapter 18. Now, this is a, another, probably, probably the more famous. I don't, I don't know if you would say it's more famous than Isaiah 64. I don't know. I think most people go to I, Jeremiah 18 when you're dealing with the potter and clay uh, story because there's just more talked about there, okay? But uh, in verse... 5, Jeremiah 18 and verse 5, it says, Then the word of the Lord came to me, saying, O house of Israel, can, cannot I do with you as this potter, said the Lord? So he gave this illustration of potter and clay. Behold, as the clay is in the potter's hand, so are ye in mine hand, O house of Israel. So he's talking to the house of Israel. But what's interesting is what he says about the clay. Okay, Notice in verse 7, it says, At what instance I speak I shall speak concerning a nation. So is he talking to uh, individuals or is he talking to a nation as a whole when he's talking about this clay? Well, first of all, he says, oh, house of Israel. He's talking about the house of Israel. He's not talking to specific people. He's just saying the house of Israel. So you're talking about the nation of Israel, right? It says, of what instance I shall speak concerning a nation and concerning a kingdom to pluck up and to pull down and to destroy it. If that nation against whom I have pronounced turn from their evil, I will repent of the evil that I thought to do unto them. And at what instance, instant I shall speak concerning a nation and concerning a kingdom to build and to plant it, if it do evil in my sight, that it obey not my voice, then I will repent of the good wherewith I said I would benefit them. So in this passage, is it, isn't it super clear that when he's talking about the potter and the clay, he's talking about him with other nations? Go to Romans chapter 9. Romans chapter 9. Now, Romans chapter 9, Calvinists love this passage, but you know who also loves this passage? Zionists. And, but the thing that you have to understand here is that the potter, you know, in the clay here, this reference is going to be brought up. But this whole passage is dealing with nations. If you think about when it says, the elder shall serve the younger. Okay, I believe it's in verse 12. I don't have it on my notes here, but in verse 12 it says, the elder, the elder shall serve the younger. Talking about Jacob and Esau. If you go back to where it's talking about that, it says nations, doesn't it? There's two nations in that womb. And two manner of people. So you're talking about two nations in that illustration. Then it says, in verse 13, as it is written, Jacob have I loved, but Esau have I hated. When you go to Malachi 1, where that's mentioned, what are you dealing with? The nation of Israel and the nation of Edom and the people in which he has indignation forever. What are you talking about? You're talking about nations. Then it goes on and it says, For he said to Moses, I will have mercy on whom I will have mercy, and I will have compassion on whom I will have compassion. So then is it not of him that willeth, nor of him that runneth, but of whom God showeth mercy, for the scripture saith unto Pharaoh, Even for this same purpose have I raised thee up, that I might show thy, my power in thee, that my name might be declared throughout all the earth. Therefore hath he mercy on whom he will have mercy, and whom he will he hardeneth. Thou wilt say unto me, Why did, doth he yet find fault? For who hath resisted his will? Nay, but, O man, who art thou that replies against God? Shall the thing formed say to him that formed it, Why hast thou made me thus? Hath not the potter power over the clay? Where is that brought up at? Jeremiah 18. Of the same lump to make one vessel unto honor and another unto dishonor? 
Now, in context, if you're going to take that back to where it said, what are we talking about? Nations. You're talking about how he destroyed the nation of Egypt. And obviously, he destroyed it using Pharaoh and hardening his heart, using the leadership there. He destroyed Egypt to save Israel out of it. And you're talking about plucking up nations. So this idea of, you know, uh, even with Jacob and Esau, that's talking about nations. With this example of the potter and the clay, he's talking about nations. In verse 22 there, it says, What if God, willing to show his wrath and to make his power known, endured with long suffering the vessels of wrath fitted to destruction, and that he might make known the riches of his glory on the vessels of mercy, which he had afore prepared unto glory, even us, whom he hath called, not of the Jews only, but also of the Gentiles. So when you're dealing with these, the clay that's being brought up here, you know, you're dealing with nations, but nations could also be groups of people as well, meaning that nations are made up of people, which would be vessels that would be in there. And in this case, I believe you're dealing with vessels of wrath and vessels of mercy. You're dealing with the children of God, children of the devil, and that dichotomy that's dealing with there. So when you're dealing with the potter and the clay, you can see that holistic type of manner of just, you know, he created everybody, right? So everybody's the clay. He's the potter, though. He's the maker. You can think about the fact that when he's talking about the potter and the clay, a lot of times he's dealing with nations. He's, he's dealing with kingdoms. And when you go to Romans chapter 11, which you're, we're not going to tonight, when you're dealing with these branches, you're dealing with nations. You're not dealing with individual people. And that's important to know when you're dealing with that passage, too, because that's where a lot of people think you can lose your salvation or something like that. But he's talking about plucking up nations which is what Jeremiah 18 talks about, plucking up nations or blessing nations. Um, but in Romans 9, you could also see the fact that he's talking about vessels of wrath, kind of like Pharaoh, the person, was a vessel fitted unto wrath and unto destruction, not from the womb, but just, you know, obviously he hardened his heart and God hardened his heart and used him to basically uh, show his glory throughout the whole earth. But then there's vessels of mercy. So you have the, the vessels of wrath, Reprobates, you have the vessels of mercy, those that have obtained mercy of the Lord by believing on the Lord Jesus Christ. But within even the vessels of mercy, I believe there's vessels of honor and dishonor. Go to 2 Timothy chapter 2. 2 Timothy chapter 2. So when you have these illustrations of the potter and the clay, you can't simplify it too much to be like, this is what the clay is, right? Or it's talking about this application. You've got to look at context, okay? So the context of Romans 9 is talking about those that God hates and those that God loves, right? So those are two extremes. And, you know, so when you're dealing with, and you're dealing with nations in a lot of that cases, like he, hate, he hates a whole nation, all that. He loves a whole nation at, holistically. But then in 2 Timothy chapter 2, I believe you're talking about saved people. It says in verse 19, Nevertheless, the foundation of God standeth sure, having this seal, the Lord knoweth them that are his, and let every one that nameth the name of Christ depart from iniquity. So what's the context here? It's saying that the Lord knoweth them that are his. So we're talking about his people, the believers. And it's saying, and at the end there, it says, and let every one that nameth the name of Christ depart from iniquity. So he's basically saying, let all those that name the name of Christ, all believers, right? Depart from iniquity. So he's basically calling them to action. You know, go depart from iniquity. If you're going to name the name of Christ, then you need to depart from iniquity. Then it says in verse 20, But in a great house there are not only vessels of gold and of silver, but also of wood and of earth, and some to honor and some to dishonor. If a man therefore purge himself from these, he shall be a vessel unto honor, sanctified and meet for the master's use, and prepared unto every good work. So when it says... If a man therefore purge himself from these, what is he talking about? I believe from iniquity. The context is to depart from iniquity. And I believe the vessels of honor and dishonor are talking about Christians that are either giving honor to God or dishonoring God. But here's the thing, though. What I believe it's stating is that in a great house, in any great house, right? That's what it's basically saying. In any great house, there's vessels of honor and dishonor, right? Meaning... If you think of a house, there's, there's like the good vessels, and then there's like the vessels that are not so good, right? But you think about the comparison of gold and silver and earth and, uh, you know, wood and earth. 
you can kind of think about the judgment seat of Christ, right? You think about the fact of you have gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, stubble, right? And the idea is that some things are very precious and valuable, will test through the fire, and then other things will be burned up and, you know, are not, you know, going to last, okay? And I believe it's stating here that if you think about the church of God, right, any great church of God is going to have a mixture of, of vessels of honor and vessels of dishonor, meaning this is that you're going to have people in the church that aren't, like, doing great things for God or they struggle with iniquity and all that, right? Or you're going to have people that you're going to throw out, you're going to have leaven that you're dealing with. And I believe what it's teaching here is that you're always going to have this, right? You're not just going to have a church where everybody is just like lock and stab. No one's struggling with sin. No one's, you know what I mean? There's always going to be, you're, to have a church where everybody's soul winning is not realistic. Now, would I like that? Of course I would like that, that everyone goes soul winning. But realistically, it's just not going, in any great house, I don't believe you're going to have that case. And I believe that's what the Bible is teaching here is that just know that there's going to be some on the honor, some on the dishonor. But listen, if you want to be a vessel on the honor, you need to purge yourselves from those iniquities. Right? If you're going to think about it, if you want to be fruitful, what do you have to do? You have to abide in the vine. And if you abide in the vine, what's he going to do? He's going to purge you. He's going to purge you of what? Sins, right? Sins and things that would, you know, the, the sin which does so easily beset us, right? So that we can run the, 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 the race of patience, or I'm misquoting that, but the idea here is that when you deal with the potter and the clay, you got to think about that on a Christian level as well. Obviously, God, you know, holistically can mold someone, you know, once, you know, basically uh, he can harden somebody over here and mold them into being a reprobate in order to have a bigger cause as far as like with Pharaoh and how he would uh, to have mercy on more people to get him saved, right? And he can do with what he wants. I mean, if he, he literally holds the breath of humanity in his hand and he can kill anybody right now. At any moment, he can take someone out. He's the potter. And this whole world is the clay. Make no mistake about that. But as believers, listen, we're still his clay. And as the potter, you know, we, we need to have reverence to the potter and let him mold us. Let him, you know, form us into what he wants us to be. And this is where you really just have to say, you know, you have to put it on the Lord that he's the one that's going to, uh, you know, basically, you know, direct your paths. What you want to do may not be what God wants you to do. And obviously, I'm not talking about God speaking to you out of the sky and saying, go buy this house, go do this, or go do that. That's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about the fact that, um, you know, what you want to do in life, if that impedes with church or soul winning or doing other things, then, then you have to think about that as far as uh, what God is wanting you to do first. And he'll mold you in that way. And if you, if you just do the things that God specifically says in the Bible, the, 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 you know, the will of God is that you depart from iniquity. You know, the will of God is that you flee fornication. You know, like the sanctification. You know, all these different things that, that these are just clear things. If you just would purge these things out, God's going to mold you for a certain purpose. You may not know what that is yet, but there may come a time where, hey, you know what? There's an opportunity for you to start preaching over here. And there's an opportunity for you to start a church over here. Well, that doesn't just happen automatically, and it's not just going to be like, oh, there's an opportunity, I better get ready. No, you better be getting ready way, be, way before that opportunity comes. It needs to be to where that opportunity comes, and you're like, all right, I'm ready to do that. You know, and you may not know that that's what God wanted you to do, or that he was planning for that to come about. And you know what? Let God mold you into what he wants you to be. And, you know, obviously through his word. His word is what needs to mold you, not you know, your feelings and, and, you know, like, God told me to do this. God told me to do that. Well, unless you give me chapter and verse, then no, he didn't. <laughs> okay. Um, now, uh, the last thing I want to show you in the end of the chapter here is really God's mercy. And, and really at the end of this chapter, 
it, it's really showing you, like, yeah, we've sinned. And you can definitely see the dual meaning of this passage on, like, the fact of, like, sinning and, like, having a physical punishment, you know, even as Christians, you know, having physical punishment and chastisement that could happen um, from the Lord, but that the Lord is merciful. And now, in verse 9, it says, Be not wroth, very sore, O Lord. So basically, you think about it, it's like we've sinned, our iniquities, you know, and all these things are with us still, and all these different things that, that are being said in this passage. And it's, he's saying, be not wroth, very sore, right? I know you're going to be wroth, but don't be that wroth, right? And wroth means to be angry, right? To be wrathful, to be the angry, right? So it says, be not wroth, very sore, Lord, neither remember iniquity forever. Behold, see, we beseech thee, we are all thy people. Now, if you think about it, the, the Lord shall judge his people, the Bible says. It's a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. And it says, you know, vengeance is mine, I will repay, said the Lord, as it is written, the Lord shall judge his people. So that's what I believe this is talking about right here, is, is the fact that you have Christians, and he basically he's stating here, you know, we're your people, you know, don't... Don't be, you know, wroth forever. You know, don't remember our iniquity forever. Now, obviously, spiritually speaking, as a saved person, our sins and iniquities he remembers no more. But physically speaking, God is not mocked for whatsoever man soweth, that shall he also reap. And the idea is that, you know, he's basically saying, you know, please forget about our iniquities and don't remember those forever. You know, like, uh, the idea is like, I know you're angry. You know, like, I know that you're angry, but, you know, don't be super angry. It's kind of the, the modern vernacular I would, I would think you would say here. Verse 10, thy holy cities are a wilderness. Zion is a wilderness. Jerusalem a desolation. Our holy and our beautiful house where our fathers praise thee is burned up with fire and all our pleasant things are laid waste. Now, you can definitely see how prophetically you'd be dealing with Babylon, you know, and how Babylon literally burned up everything, right? They burned down Jerusalem and the house of God, all that stuff. So you can definitely see how this would be like a prophetic thing in the fact that he was wroth with them, but he didn't remember, he didn't remember their iniquity forever because after 70 years, he brought them back. And you can definitely see that. And dealing with his people and how you may, there may be this time where he's going to be chastising you, hopefully not for 70 years because we don't live that long and you know, that would be rough. But at the same time, you can never see how that applies. Verse 12, it says, Wilt thou refrain thyself for these things, O Lord? Wilt thou hold thy peace and afflict us very sore? So he's, the, the, the question is being posed, you know, and it's basically saying, don't be very sore with us. And then it ends with, are you, are you, are you going to be very sore with us? You know, it's like this question that, that's being given to God. It's, it's basically asking for mercy, right? This whole thing is asking for mercy. Go back to Isaiah 54, because it makes me think of this passage in Isaiah 54. Because it also makes me think of the fact that, you know what, God will chasten his children, but ultimately he'll never take away his loving kindness from us. And, you know, you say, well, I thought we're not a point under wrath because we're going to see like wrath mentioned here and stuff like that. But what you have to understand is that our body is still a child of wrath okay it's still a child of disobedience it has not been regenerated and so therefore it is abiding in wrath until it dies right or until we're changed obviously but notice what it says in isaiah 54 and verse 7 it says for a small moment have i forsaken thee but with great mercies will i gather thee in a little wrath i hid my face from thee for a moment and that's the language that's used in Isaiah 64 is about you hid our fa your hate face from us, you know, all these different things that are being mentioned here with their, their iniquities. In a little wrath, I hid my face from thee for a moment, but with everlasting kindness will I have mercy on thee, said the Lord thy Redeemer. See how it kind of makes sense when you think about the fact that it's like we've sinned and we shall be saved. And these different things that are being said in Isaiah 64. Verse Isaiah, or verse 9 of Isaiah 54, it says, For this is, is as the waters of Noah unto me. For as I have sworn that the waters of Noah shall no more go over the earth, so have I sworn that I would not be wroth with thee, nor rebuke thee. For the mountains shall depart, and the hills be removed. But my kindness shall not depart from thee, neither shall the covenant of my peace be removed, said the Lord. 
that hath mercy on me. And that, this is a great eternal security passage, to be honest with you. It's the fact that, you know, I, I was wroth with you for a little bit, but it's for a moment. But you know what? Out of that's going to be great mercies. Out of that's going to be everlasting kindness. It says in verse 11, O thou afflicted, tossed with tempest, and not comforted, behold, I will lay thy stones with fair colors, and lay thy foundations with sapphires. I will make thy windows of agates, and thy gates of carbuncles, and all thy borders of pleasant stones, and all thy children shall be taught of the Lord, and great shall be the peace of thy children. In righteousness shalt thou be established. Thou shalt be far from oppression, for thou shalt not fear, and from terror, for it shall not come near thee. And I know we've already went through that passage, but I believe that basically that would be the answer. Because they're basically saying our, our righteousnesses are as filthy rags, we're all as an unclean thing, you're wroth, Behold, thou art wroth, for we have sinned. But ultimately, we're going to be saved. You know, and we shall be saved. And even in the Old Testament, in Isaiah, it's understanding that, yes, God is chastening them. Yes, God is punishing them for their sins, but it's not going to be forever. Meaning, like, in this life, he can punish you for your sins. In this life, he can do that, but he's not going to take away his covenant from you that covenant of mercy and peace that he gave to you, he's not going to take away that. It's just for a little moment. And here's the thing. If it was for the rest of your life, that's still a little moment. Let's say it was for 70 years until you died. What is our life? It is even a vapor that appears for a little time and then vanishes away. So that would still be for a little moment that he'd be wroth with you while you're living in the flesh. Now, now, here's the way of him not being wroth with you. Don't live in the flesh. You know, walk in the Spirit. You know, because if you have the fruit of the Spirit, you know, uh, you know abiding in you and you're, 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 you're walking in the Spirit, it says against such there is no law. So, we're obviously dealing with Israel as being like disobedient and in, in sin, but ultimately the promise is, is that he's their Redeemer. He's their Father, right? As far as talking about spiritually speaking, you know, God is our Father, He's our Maker, He's our Redeemer, and yes, He can be He can be wroth with us, and He can have this fear, you know, this fear. We could have this fearful looking for of indignation and fiery judgment. Why? Because the Lord shall judge His people, and we are all His people, as it says in Isaiah 64. And our prayer is like. Our prayer, obviously, if we were in sin, it was like, don't remember this forever. You know, don't remember this, you know, for the rest of our lives, you know, this iniquity. And don't be, don't be really mad with us. <laughs> you know, it's kind of like that idea of like, I know you're mad at me, but don't be extremely mad at me. Don't be sorely wroth. And that's kind of, it kind of ends that chapter on that question. What, are you going to? And... But what we have to understand is that God is very merciful. He's, he's pitiful and of tender mercy and very gracious. And you know what? In the New Testament, it says that we come boldly unto the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy and find uh, grace to help in time of need. And you know what? We have a merciful and faithful high priest and things pertaining unto God. You know, he was tempted in all points like as we are, yet without sin. We don't have a high priest which cannot be touched with the feelings of our infirmities, meaning that he knows exactly what we're going through. He knows exactly how that feels, all that, as far as the temptations. Now, obviously, he never sinned, but at the same time, you know, we, we, you could say, well, you know, God doesn't understand the state that I'm in. He was made in the likeness of sinful flesh, but in him is no sin, and neither with God found in his mouth. And so, yeah, he knows exactly what you're going through. He knows exactly the, the temptations, all those different things. The difference is, is that he's God, and he didn't actually indulge in any of those. And he actually was perfect. He actually was in continuance and all of that. He's the only one that was, though. <laughs> so Isaiah 64 has got some interesting stuff in it. Um, like I said, verse 5, not a complicated subject that's being mentioned, right? But the question is, you know, you look at it and you're like, what is this saying? You know, like, what is this talking about? And so, um, definitely interesting. But we have a couple more chapters in Isaiah. And uh, then we'll be moving on to another book. I'm probably going to be going into the New Testament, to be honest with you. Take a, take a break from the expository in the Old Testament. And maybe do, like, an epistle or something like that, you know. We did 66, after doing 66 chapters, maybe we'll do, like, you know, I don't know. 
Yeah, I already did Jude though. Yeah, I'll do Second John, Second and Third John. You know, <laughs> feel like we accomplished something. You know, no. uh, but uh, but Isaiah sixty four, great chapter. Um, let's end with a word of prayer to Heavenly Father. We thank you for today. Thank you for your word, and thank you for this passage. And Lord, just help us to to realize every day that you are the Potter and we are the clay. And Lord, help to form us and to purge us from any iniquities and to depart from iniquity. And Lord, so that we'd be a vessel unto honor and that we'd be glorifying to you. And Lord, I pray that you be with all those that can't make, that couldn't make it tonight. And just pray that you be with us throughout the rest of this week. Give us safety in our travels and be with us as we go back to work. And Lord, we love you and pray all this in Jesus Christ's name. Amen.